Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world, and welcome today to the future of finance, trends, strategies, and predictions brought to you um, on by Entrepreneur, but because of the generous, generous, and amazing sponsorship that we share with Oracle NetSuite. The voice that you're hearing right now is the voice of me, Jill Schiffelbein, who is going to be your moderator today. And I'm going to introduce myself and, more importantly, our two incredible panelists to you in just a minute. But before we do, I want to give you some ground rules on how this is going to be run today. First and foremost, one of the most popular questions we get asked is, is there going to be a recording of this in case I have to miss part of it or I want to re-listen to the brilliance of the panelists or I have to cut out early for an important meeting? Of course there's going to be. Within about a week, you will have a cleaned up recording link sent to you so you'll have access to all the goodness that you see here today and take part in today as a recording. So know that that is coming to you. That's logistic number one. Logistic number two is questions. We want this to be an interactive experience for everyone involved. And that doesn't mean you can passively just sit and watch, which of course you can, but you can also actively get involved by asking questions. How to do that is in the control panel, you'll click on the questions area. There's a little triangle, you'll click it so the arrow will now point down. When you do, you'll see a question area and you can type your question in there. To test it out now, I would love to know, everyone hands on your keyboard, where are you logging in from today? Where around the world is everyone coming from today? I know we have a panelist in Chicago, a panelist in New York, myself, I happen to be in Houston today. Ooh, Israel, David, welcome from Israel. So far, the first to respond and pretty uh, international. I love it. Some Washington, D.C., Minnesota, Berkshire, the U.K. Hey, U.K., what's up? India, Atlanta, Toronto, Mexico, Namibia. Oh, my goodness. We are hitting pretty much every continent right now that I'm seeing. Mozambique, fantastic. Hey, a couple of other people in the Houston area, too. Portugal, Germany, Tampa, Istanbul, Myrtle Beach, Norway. Okay, I can't even keep up with you guys. You are rapid on the keyboard. And Greece, hello, shout outs, Brazil, Everyone right there, thank you so much for chiming in. That, what you just did, is exactly how you will pitch questions to me to deliver to the panelists throughout the webinar today. And I will be mining those throughout the presentation. We will have a formal Q&A at the end, but what I like to do is when you have a question that's directly related to some content that's happening now, if I can, as moderator, I'm gonna pitch those to our amazing panelists. So if you have questions, please go ahead and type them in. Please keep them pertinent to the topic that we have today because obviously questions that are super specific to you that aren't going to help the hundreds of other people on the line, I'm not going to pitch to the panelists. So make the questions related to the content related to lots of business owners, entrepreneurs, and financial types, and that question is going to get asked live on the air and will be recorded for all eternity. So thank you so much for joining us. You guys are amazing and interactive. This is going to be a fun one today. Let me first click on over to a slide so you can see who is speaking at you. And if we can go to that next slide, you'll see me. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill. I am your moderator. Maybe some of you have been on webinars with me before. And if you have, give me a shout out in the questions area. I love working with Oracle NetSuite to bring these webinars and this content to all of you because I get to interact with some of the most brilliant panelists from around the world in curating this content. And it's an amazing experience. I get to do it through my company in conjunction with Entrepreneur and bringing all this awesome stuff to you. So thank you guys for the shout outs, Greg and Stuart, especially in the chat area or in the questions area. And what brings me the most joy is getting together really smart and savvy people to share their brilliance with all of you. And on the next slide, I'm going to introduce you to our two speakers today. On the left, we have Carl Seidman. On the right, Matt Rosetta. Let me tell you about each of these gentlemen and why I'm super stoked to have them with us today. First of all, Carl. You can see the short bio on the screen for both of them, but what you really need to know about Carl is he is one of the most, like, he can zoom out and analyze a situation like nobody's business. 
his job, it's his own company, and what he does is he coaches financial planning and analysis professionals at Fortune 500 companies, at mid-market companies, and he helps them establish best practices, processes, and perhaps most importantly right now, sustainable business models with a real key and focus on the finance function. He's a CPA, CFE, CFF, and all these other acronyms and letters and accomplishments that I don't have time to list, but what you're going to learn from him is his real status in different areas of the market as it all pertains to the financial role leads to some really interesting predictions that are going to be unveiled today. On the right, Matt Rosetta. Now, Matt is someone who has the true poise and calm and control of a leader that you want to work for. He's the founder and CEO of North Six Agency, N6A, which is a leading brand communications agency in New York, and it's one of the 50 most powerful agencies in the U.S., as said by Observer. It's PR Week's best places um, on the list for best places to work for, and it happens to be one of the top company cultures in America, ranked by us here at Entrepreneur. He serves on a ton of boards, but when you see the insights he has to share from how he's founded this company and grown it into one of these major powerhouses, so much of that emphasis is on the financial role and the importance of collaboration with it. So you're going to get two very well-balanced and two very expert perspectives today from our panelists. And yes, I see some notes coming in in the questions area, impressive speakers, 100%. I absolutely love bringing them both to you. So without further ado, I'm going to transition us into our first of five. We talked about five potential uh, predictions that we're going to share with you on the future of finance today. And the first one is this, beyond the finance role. CFOs, chief financial officers, will be expected to serve as advisors to non-financial operating divisions of enterprises. So now, to give us some insight behind this first prediction, let me to bring Carl on the line. Welcome, Carl, and if we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Jill. Uh, to your point, CFOs are going to have a very unique role in the future, but I would even take it a step further and say that financial professionals from the CFO all the way down to financial analysts are all going to be expected to serve as what I might call uh, financial advisors to non-financial operating divisions of companies. And of course, while this is already becoming more common, I think that we're still many years away from this really being the standard. So in other words, financial professionals across all levels of experience are going to be expected to behave more like junior CFOs. And if I may just share a, a real quick example of a recent client, uh, for those of you who are in the U.S., many of you know that there is no legal mandate for paid maternity and, and paternity leave. However, for this particular company, they recognize the importance of paid leave for the retention of their best people. Now, while HR or human resources might say, yes, of course we want to do this, well, HR is often not in the position to know the financial impact. And similarly, finance may not be fully entrenched in HR policy. So it's vital for these two functions to be partnering together and ask and answer, well, what is the right policy? For how long should it be implemented? And for how much? What should the cost be? The term that all of you are going to hear more of is the term financial business partnership, where financial people are going to be increasingly uh, positioned to understand the non-financial sides of the business than they already do. And not only do they need to better understand it, they're going to need to simplify their findings, simplify their jargon in ways that non-financial people can better understand. Finally, a lot more information is going to come to financial people through automated reporting and queries. And they're going to need to be more proactive and not reactive about how that information impacts non-financial parts of the business. So in summary, we're going to see financial people partnering more with non-financial professionals, almost like a junior CFO, and they'll need to be far better critical and forward thinkers. Thank you so much for that insight, Carl. And I'm curious, for those of you on the line, go to that questions area in the control now, panel now for me, please. How many of you are either I am directly a finance role or I am responsible for communicating with someone in a finance role? So if you could uh, chime in and give us some uh, 
idea of who is on the line today. And so I'm seeing um, a lot of people initially that are communicating in a finance role, but ooh, now there's a lot of direct finance roles coming in, some CEOs and some people from other areas of the company working. So obviously from this first point, everyone on the line kind of understands where this is going, that need to communicate, the need to be proactive. And as I bring Matt on the line for the next slide here, he's going to give us some more contextualization for beyond this financial role from his perspective. And if we can go back to the previous slide there, um, we will get Matt on the line and he'll be able to share some insights. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Jill. First off, it's uh, great to be here with you, Jill and Carl, and a big thank you for having me on the program. Thanks to uh, Entrepreneur Oracle and NetSuite for putting this together. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, m my big message here that I wanted to get across is the importance of alignment uh, and integration of a CFO in an organization. There's uh, certainly, I think, a uh, misconception that a CFO is just a numbers position. You know, in my experience, a CFO is much more than just a numbers position. It's really an integration position. In fact, you know, in our learnings here at N6A, more than any other position in our own organization, I would say that the CFO is the one that has needed to be uh, fully integrated and aligned with every other department and function in order to make the whole company work. Um, and I think, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and a CEO in particular, I think there is a misperception that a CFO is a liability. That, uh, that's probably the furthest thing from the truth. I wouldn't view a CFO as a liability at all. I would view a CFO as an asset. It's just an asset that you need to pay. And, you know, I remember back to when we were first starting to scale N6A and I was dealing with the same type of pressures and um, uncertainties and anxieties that a lot of CEOs deal with as they evaluate whether or not to make a non-revenue generating expenditure, um, you know, in their business. And, you know, when we were looking at our CFO, we were thinking about, well, that's a lot of money. It's a considerable investment and it's a lot of money that could be redirected toward other revenue generating areas or to our service operation. I sort of look back at that now and I laugh because what we found is that the CFO was the best, um, you know, was the best investment we could have ever made. And I think the reason why it's been the best investment we've ever made is because it, it's been fully aligned and integrated with all other departments in the company, not just myself at, you know, at the CEO level, but also, you know, uh, sales, operations, IT, uh, service, you know, you name it, a good CFO will pay for themselves tenfold in our experience in, in terms of what you see via cost savings, via improvements in efficiencies, and by bringing new perspectives to the company that you otherwise would have, uh, would have missed out on. So in summary, you know, in our experience, the CFO was the best investment we could have ever made. It just needs to be properly aligned and integrated with all other uh, departments within the company. Uh, back to you, Jill. Thank you so much, Matt. And I think what was so interesting about this, the beyond the role of finance, right, in this first section here, is we see the integration across different sectors of the business, um, as Carl pointed out, the need to be proactive, the need to communicate, and then from Matt's point of view, especially how it is integrated, the CFO role, and how as a CEO, you have to, with intention, make sure this role is integrated within the company and all the different areas in order to recoup that investment is really a brilliant outlaying of an overview of what we're talking about here today in the future of finance. So let's transition to the next category here, kind of the next prediction, where the whole CFO role, where this financial future is taking us in the business setting, and that is beyond Excel. I'm curious, type in a quick Y for yes for me in the questions area or N for no. How many of you use Excel as a pretty significant tool in your business? Rapid fire, type in Y for yes if you do, N for no if you don't. And oh my goodness, I am seeing the fastest responses of the over overwhelming amount of yeses, maybe five to 10% uh, in here with no, but the vast majority of yeses, and that's what we're finding. Our experts that I interviewed, who you're going to hear from in a second, they told me that too. But the prediction and where we're going in the future is we're going to see more customizable, bespoke, flexible, scalable, and affordable solutions move downstream so it becomes more accessible in many different ways to entrepreneurs of all sides and all sizes. So if we can go to the next slide, Matt, give us your take on this as a CEO. Sure, thanks, Jill. Um, so look, for, you know, from, from my perspective, all other tools are valuable as complementary assets, but Excel remains the nucleus that these tools tie back to and the tool from which we use 
uh, to make decisions at an executive level. That hasn't changed. You know, we've been in business for 10 years now, and at every step of the way, we've involved, we've invested uh, considerably in you know other tools, you know, CRM tools, financial analytic tools, but. Um, Excel has remained sort of the constant presence in our business when it comes to, you know, utilizing a tool that we can use to make decisions. I think, you know, I sort of uh, liken it to, uh, to cars. You know, there's a lot of tools out there, CRM tools, financial analytics, whatever it might be that are high speed. Um, they're incredibly fancy in some cases. They could be luxurious and in their own way, they serve a real purpose in your organization, but Excel is sort of like a Volvo. You know, Excel you can use to get from point A to point B safely, securely. You know, it's, you're not gonna have to worry about crashing. And when it comes to making executive level decisions, it's all about reducing your error rate, making, you know, smart, sound decisions that are gonna set up the business for sustainable long-term success. So in our experience, Excel has served that purpose perfectly at every step of scale over the past decade. And again, we've invested a lot, you know, in other tools, but, uh, but we still look at Excel as that, um, you know, as the core fundamental tool that we use to, to decide uh, at a boardroom level. And, uh, and back to you, Jill. Thank you for that, Matt. And I think it's really indicative of how this tool is used, but then what opportunities in the marketplace there are for other tools to come in and really have a part in that and be integrated in that way. Carl, I know you have some insights on this from your perspective and experience working with people in all different industries as well. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll get Carl to come on and give him a chance to share some of those insights. Carl? Sure. Thank you, Jill. Uh, so I have a little bit of overlap with, with Matt's um, you know, perspective, but also a little bit of a different one as well. Uh, I don't have to speculate how many of you on this webinar use Excel because you've just shared how many of you do. Uh, and in fact, it was Deloitte who had come up with a survey several years ago uh, to survey large global corporations internationally as to uh, the percentage of those that still use Excel either as a primary or secondary tool in planning and forecasting, and it's still overwhelming. Uh, so even if you're at a smaller mid-sized company, you're still in good company uh, among those that are, are much larger than yours. However, the challenges that we have with Excel, uh, even though it's been on, on many of your PCs, uh, you know, for several decades, uh, is it is a bit fractured and it does have its limitations. Many of you are probably very aware that Excel is not a great accounting tool. So you end up uh, engaging with QuickBooks or Sage or Intact to help you with uh, your accounting. And then when you wanna go over to purchasing and inventory management and payroll and expenses, you have all of these other platforms that you can be using for that. The challenge arises when we need systems to do more. And companies end up finding that they get stuck in so many platforms that loosely integrate together. And to Matt's point, he said, yes, of course they do end up in Excel, uh, which is, is the point of many of our uh, analyses that we're conducting. But at the same time, it's very laborious and cumbersome and very manual. Uh, just a couple of months ago, I was speaking with an advisor uh, who was working with a very large winery out west uh, in California, and he said for this company that's doing over $100 million worth of revenue, they are managing their inventory on Excel, believe it or not. Uh, so I, I do believe that there is a better way uh, that I and my firm, we recommend to companies that we work with. A lot of my clients have moved over to what I would call fully integrated financial platforms. Uh, they are really natively uh, you know, housed within the company. Some of them may be cloud-based, but many of them will be uh, physically maintained at the property. Uh, and what they allow the company to do is to add in all these various modules that can be scaled effectively. Uh, one of my clients is a global manufacturing client, coincidentally, that has moved over to NetSuite. Uh, I have a distribution client uh, that has moved other over to Anaplan. There are a whole lot of unique platforms that allow a company to integrate its processes and reporting very effectively and scale it very well. What we're going to see in the future are an increase uh, of companies investing in these scalable, fully integrated financial solutions. But the key here, and this is what's perhaps uh, you know, something worth celebrating among all of you, is that they're going to move further downstream and become more affordable. Back to you, Jill. And I know for myself as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure many on the line, that affordability is something that is really exciting in this space, enabling you know small and mid-sized businesses especially to be able to compete from 
a data standpoint with other larger competitors. And so much so that this next section that we're going into takes this Excel conversation, but takes it way, way further and really looks at how we're going to be financially in the future beyond the data. The CFO role is responsible for more than analyzing the data. It needs to look beyond the data to aid in decision making. CFO roles, financial roles, analysis roles in the past were really to give some basic recommendations, but the active role in that data processing, the analysis, is moving more and more towards decision making right now. And this is a really neat trend for analysts and people in all types of financial professional positions. Carl, if you want to come on the line and talk to us about some of the maybe most vital demands that we're going to be seeing for people who are in finance roles, if we can go to the next slide. Right. So it's really a, an exciting time to be in this profession. And if, if there's one point that I can make across the entire finance function from financial analysts all the way up to the CFO, it is a greater need to be proactive and forward thinking rather than reactive and siloed. Three of the most vital demands uh, that I see in finance and have over the last few years are one, the access to quality information and data. Two, the accuracy of analysis and forecasts and plans. And three, the speed and confidence in decision making. Now, ironically, these three demands, I would also say, are some of the more challenging to address. These are challenges now, but I would argue in the future, they're going to be even a bigger deal because global competition is going to increase. Uh, we're going to have greater abundance and access to information, so data integrity is going to increase. Uh, the speed in decision making is going to increase. Uh, the speed to market is likely going to see the, be seen as a value for most companies. Okay, so it, again, in other words, these three vital demands are just going to become even more important. And so getting them wrong is going to be even more harmful and is going to require even better human and technological solutions. Okay, so what I very much encourage companies to do as we move to the future of finance uh, is understand where is where the data is coming from, the quality of that information, and be able to sanitize it and carve it in the right way. It is not enough just to have access to the information. You need to be able to use it. And that's where we are challenged right now, is having so much information saying, I don't know what the quality is, and also I don't know what to do with it. Okay, so companies and financial professionals need to understand what their reports are telling them, be able to act upon them quickly and with great confidence, not just react to them. So to recap just the three points, importance of quality information, accuracy of the analysis, forecasts, and plans, and the speed and confidence in decision making. Thank you so much, Carl, for that amazing outlay. And we can start to see this bigger picture come together. And as a moderator, I get the joy of interviewing both of our panelists before curating this content and bringing it to all of you. And when I had my interview with Matt, he gave me just off the cuff one of what I think is one of the best quotes I have heard around data. And I'm not going to spoil it. So Matt, if you want to come on and we'll go to the next slide and you can tell us about this famous quote of yours that I love so much. Sure, Jill. Well, you know, I have a... Um... I have a saying here at N6A, particularly with my direct reports, data without discretion is destruction. And in our experience, that has been 100% um, true to, and you know, been the case for the past 10 years. I think the important takeaway here is that data is a tool that should be used to guide your decisions, but never should be used to make your decisions. And that's an important distinction. Anytime we've done what I call analysis by paralysis, where we've been overly dependent on data and underdependent on our brain, uh, it's led us to very bad places. It's led us to poor decisions. Uh, we went against our gut. We, you know, either hired the wrong people, we invested in the wrong areas. Um, you know, we made other decisions that led us to bad places. And I think that's the important um, takeaway, at least from our experience, is that data can be an incredibly valuable tool, but it's a tool, and it should be used to guide decisions, uh, but never to make them.
I love that quote so much, Matt. And I think it really goes into what I know you're going to talk to us about on this next slide, really kind of like breaking down decision making. And a couple of questions have actually come in around decision making and where to look for the range of external data and how do we coach maybe financial people to do that. So if you can address that as you go through these, that would be amazing. Sure. Well, look, I would say you know, to the audience, Jill, running a business today is tougher than ever. Um, you know, we've been in business here at N6A for 10 years, and I can tell you that r running our business in 2020 is exponentially more difficult than it was in 2010, despite the fact that, you know, we've scaled considerably through the years and there's a great infrastructure in place and whatnot. But the reason running a business is very difficult today is because there's a premium on both speed and accuracy. I think that to run a business successfully today, you need to be both fast and accurate. And if you drop the ball on one, it's not going to make the cut. So, you know, the takeaway for me there in terms of how it relates to the finance function is that, look, you need to be fast to win in business today. There's a premium on both, uh, you know, speed and accuracy. I always, you know, and our CFO, Jim Morris, does a great job for us. You know, I always told him in terms of the lanes, the CFO's lane is you own the accuracy lane. You take care of making sure, you know, we're accurate in terms of our decision making. You give you know, me and the rest of our operating and our management team, all of the data and the tools we need to make decisions, uh, and I'll own the speed lane. So CFO owns accuracy. You know, it's their job to make sure that, you know, our error rate continues to drop um, in time, and the CEO owns the speed lane. And I think that that's how, you know, we've been able to really attack head on the increasingly challenging, um, you know, business operating environment, which in 2020 requires an incredible amount of um, accuracy, but it also in, it requires incredible amounts of speed. Uh, you know, for every for every decision you make or every decision you get wrong, not only does it slow you down, but it also creates an opportunity for your competition to run a lap around you. So, you know, accuracy and speed are incredibly important nowadays, and I think the CEO CFO relationship should be much more uh, clearly defined when it comes to, hey, CEO has speed, CFO has accuracy, and it can be a really powerful combination if both of those things are working, uh, you know, working together. And uh, that, that's it. Back to you, Jill. Thank you so much, Matt. And one of the questions that came in was really looking at kind of that distinction between CEO and CFO. And I know you're going to talk about it a little later, but any immediate thoughts right now on kind of the CEO CFO relationship? How are you communicating that importance of the dichotomy versus speed and accuracy? Well, number one, I think, you know, going back to the data and again, data without discretion is destruction. You know, I'll sort of say that as the caveat. I think you need to be, um, I think the CEO and CFO both need to be utilizing data. I think a lot of our improvements that we've made as an organization have to have to do with incrementalism. You know, we're just, you know, there's a rigor and a discipline to studying data, studying decisions we got right, studying decisions we got wrong, and then incrementally making improvements. So if our, you know, error rate was 10% on decisions, and by decisions, those could be any type of decisions. They could be hiring decisions. They could be investment decisions. They could be, you know, infrastructure decisions. Um, you know, let's say our error rate was 10% on those decisions two or three years ago. Uh, you know, I'll sit with my CFO and we'll be rigorous in terms of how we evaluate those decisions, which ones we got right, which ones we got wrong, with the goal and intent of just dropping that error rate. And I think that that process, rigor, discipline is important. And overnight, you're not going to get you know, your error rate from 10% down to zero, but in time, you know, with, with rigor, with discipline, with constant, you know, process and a commitment to improvement in time, you know, year after year, you'll see that error rate drop dramatically. And, you know, I look at our error rate on decisions today in 2020, it's dramatically less than it was two or three years ago. And I think it has to do with a really strong rigor and process that I have with my CFO. And we just commit to, you know, commit to getting better in time. Thank you so much for that disclosure, Matt, and really talking us through that process. And I think, you know, we've talked a lot now about that CEO-CFO relationship, but when you're looking at the financial picture, you're looking at these financial business partners, there are some other key relationships that are going to be very important that are probably already very important, but their importance is increasing over time. And if we can go to the next slide, I want to bring Carl back on to talk about some of these other relationships that financial professionals need to be aware of. Right. So certainly there is a, a vital relationship between the CFO and CEO that must exist. 
Uh, but further downstream, across the entirety of the finance function, there needs to be a great reporting structure and relationship uh, chemistry. But then even as I had mentioned, Jill, with the financial business partnerships, uh, financial professionals are going to have are going to have to have great relationships and ability to communicate outside of that function as well. Uh, what I'm starting to see, certainly in the Fortune 500, but also in a lot of the clients that you know, we at, at my firm work with, um, is that there are oftentimes going to be uh, financial planning and analysis professionals at the HQ or corporate level. Uh, there are going to be uh, shared services centers where there are going to be kind of behind the scenes uh, finance functions that can be utilized by everybody. And then there's also going to be uh, centers of excellence where uh, anyone within the company can access reports or data uh, with a high level of integrity. Now, what is interesting is this was probably about six months ago. Um, my company, we were working with a very large uh, bank. And in the group that we were working with, uh, there were probably about 50 professionals. And interestingly enough, about 30 of them were financial professionals. And then the remainder were data science professionals. And if you were to take a look back five, 10 years ago, while the data science professionals would be feeding information to those in finance, what we're starting to see now are these two groups really working hand in hand. Uh, you're gonna end up having data scientists who need to better understand finance and financial professionals who need to better understand the data science. And so what I anticipate that we're gonna see, uh, certainly now, but, but definitely into the future, is a lot of a blend across uh, functions that used to not be blended. They used to be far more siloed. And I think that it's not just better for the organizations that we work within, but also perhaps more engaging and more exciting for us as we continue to evolve our own careers. Thanks so much for that, Carl. And I think a really interesting question came in that I'm going to pitch very quickly to both you and Matt, because we're talking about all of these relationships. We've talked about beyond the role of finance and integration. Um, and Carl, I'll pitch it to you first and then over to Matt. A uh, question came in, what type of study courses or what type of skills, if you were going to tell a, a financial person, maybe you know a mid-level career financial person right now, what is one thing that you should really study to help you leverage your career path and your strength as a financial professional, what would that area be, Carl? Sure, there are, there are a handful of areas, um, but just to mention some, having a deep understanding of, of accounting and finance, technical acumen is vital. Uh, and that's something that I would hope that most people would uh, be, able to get, uh, be able to get pretty quickly after school or in the first few years of their career. Uh, the other areas I think are very important are financial analysis, critical thinking, problem solving, and financial modeling skills. Uh, those come with time, practice, and training. Uh, and you know, just, a, I guess, a little shameless plug, that's, that's what we do at our company is we go into companies and we help them build those sorts of skills and those kinds of abilities. And then finally, one of the last areas I would encourage people to become uh, much stronger with would be communication skills. That's typically not an area that uh, accounting and finance professionals are all that strong with, uh, because oftentimes they're spending their efforts on uh, technical advancement. But being an effective communicator, an effective presenter, being able to get your points across in an easy to understand way to non-financial professionals, that to me is what distinguishes one, you know, exceptional financial person from somebody who is perhaps more average. I love that last one for communication because that's exactly what I've done with banks and stuff, Carl. So <laughs> we're all in our wheelhouses here today, appropriately so. And Matt, from your perspective, what are some of the things that when you bring financial people into your organization are you're looking for? What skills do people need to have? I totally agree with Carl, Jill. I, I think, you know, I was going to take a little bit of the contrarian uh, perspective on this one. But, you know, first off, you know, I look at our CFO, Jim Mars here, and he's probably the most socially switched on CFO that I've ever worked with. I mean, I think he tells better jokes than anyone in the company. Um, but I think in general, I think a CFO um, really should study the people part of the organization, especially with the services business. I think there's a level of empathy. You know, I think they should work on EQ skills. And I think that that, you know, by, by improving, 
you know, by improving your EQ, by improving your communication skills, by developing a level of empathy with the, you know, with the rest of the organization, particularly all of the folks who are in the trenches actually doing the work and generating the revenue, I think they'll be better served as a CFO. I think they'll understand uh, contextually what sort of decisions they're making in terms of expenditure, you know, what its impact is on the, on the organization, the overall ethos and culture of the organization so that there's a level of um, understanding behind, you know, expense decisions and investment decisions. So, you know, my assumption whenever we hire a finance professional, CFO or whom, whomever it might be, is that they have the blocking and tackling skills, they have the, you know, finance 101 skills, they don't need to be trained on that. Uh, you know, so I really am more interested on the intangibles and intangibles usually are, you know, have to do with empathy, communication and innovation. Amazing. I love the clarity that you guys both presented on those skills who um people there were two people who actually asked question about skills and training so question answered as we go into our fourth of five sections today if we could transition to the next slide we've talked a ton about data and we're still going to of course talk about data because it's incredibly important but as it comes to the financial role we're moving beyond human capability and so we're going to talk about that machine learning will become an integral part of data aggregation, processing, and analytics, but I don't think it's going to become everything. So if we can go to the next slide and bring Carl on to talk to us about this machine learning and its role in the financial professions. Absolutely. Um, so Jill, to, to your point, I agree with you that it's not going to be everything. And if you were to spend some time in financial circles, uh, there's probably going to be a lot of buzz about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, and I do believe we are moving in that way. Uh, in fact, I, I work hand in hand with a few Fortune 100 companies. And uh, you know, these are companies that, that most, if not all, people on this webinar have heard of before. And they are only in the initial phase of building out machine learning. So it's really in its infancy. <clears throat> Another point that I want to make about AI and ML, or machine learning, is that, believe it or not, it needs to be programmed and managed and spearheaded by humans. Machines can't just program themselves out of the gates. Uh, and so if we are to take advantage of what the machines can do, uh, we as financial professionals probably need to become a little bit more better acquainted uh, with what the machines are going to be able to do. That may involve some familiarity with programming, but perhaps more so just familiarity with capability. Uh, where I do believe machine learning and AI will take a uh, a very front role in our business is in reporting and analytics. If you were to go into you know, a generic company, uh, that company is most likely doing uh, some degree of financial reporting and analytics. In many cases, it's, it's quite manual, it can be laborious, uh, but what I do anticipate is because it's so transactional, we should be able to outsource a lot of that to, uh, to software and to machines. Now, where our value as humans will be uh, most prevalent is being able to take that information, apply the human perspective, ways that machines can't make decisions, and use that information to, again, make better, more effective decisions. I think that we're a long way off from having full automation within businesses, but we are slowly going to migrate over there. Thank you so much, Carl. And I know on the next slide, Matt's going to talk to us about an extension of this and really about the machine learning being one data point in decision making, not the entire T of the data. Matt? Thanks, Jill. Yeah, I would say just in our experience, Jill, machine learning we found in time can be, you know, the best friend of an organization, but it can also be, um, it can also be a very dangerous thing if not utilized properly you know with without that human element to actually make the decision it can be disruptive um, you know as a quick story I actually remember and I was talking earlier about how my CFO and I will sort of you know sit down once a month and we'll align on mistakes we made and just kind of keep on working on incrementally improving that error rate you know I remember a time when we were recruiting a uh, person to join our senior uh, management team and we were down to two candidates there was candidate a and then there was candidate b and with candidate a we felt great in our gut about that candidate you know it was just a good chemistry fit and there's just you know a level of 
there's there's an intangible with an organization that you just can't put a data point on. It just felt like the right hire. And then there was candidate B, who was perfectly qualified, you know, in every sense. And we leaned on machine learning to really help predict which of those two candidates would be better suited for our organization. And the machine, you know, the analytics told us that it was candidate B by every metric in terms of, uh, you know, cost value relationship, in terms of the credentials and the background of the employee, in terms of what their likely tenure would be at our company. I mean, we did, you know, to, to use another one of those phrases from before, we kind of did analysis by paralysis to determine which of the two candidates we should, we should hire. And we ultimately pulled the trigger on candidate B over candidate A because we were overly dependent on the, you know, on the analytics, on the tools. And it was the wrong hire. It was just we, you know, we, we didn't look closely enough at the intangibles. We didn't look at the culture fit. We didn't look at, you know, the person's EQ. We didn't look at, uh, we didn't look closely enough at the person's ability to, you know, to fit into our ethos and kind of our growth, you know, our growth culture at that time. And it was the wrong hire. And then obviously the cost of people decisions is incredibly, um, you know, is, inc is incredible to an organization. I mean, that set us back 12 to 18 months. You know, there's opportunity costs you lose along the way. And that's just, a, and there's been several other examples, obviously, through the years. Uh, but that's one example of where machine learning can be a very valuable tool to an organization, but it can't replace, you know, the discretion and the human brain when it comes to actually making the decision. So we'll always use the machine or the analytics or the tool to guide our decisions, but we'll always use our brain power to, uh, to actually make the decision. Thank you so much for sharing that story, Matt. I know when you shared it in the interview with me, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a perfect example for people to hear because machines and data alone does not tell the entire story, which is a very important thing to point out. And shameless plug, everyone on the line, next month, Entrepreneur and Oracle NetSuite are actually bringing you another webinar related to this on how to tell your business's financial story beyond the data as well. So a huge theme that's tying together the first part of this year because we're seeing so many businesses are really needing to address these areas. And as we transition into the fifth and final prediction today before we head into an open Q&A time, and you guys have been amazing getting me questions in that questions area. I have tons of them written down. Some of them have already been answered in the natural course of the webinar. But this last one, for a few minutes, Matt is going to talk to us about beyond innovative ideas and how innovation initiatives will need to have finance at the core. And this will go to a lot of you who ask the questions on how important the integration of the financial function is, because a lot of people have had that role really siloed in an organization. And so how valuable is this integration? What are some steps for doing it and how you can make that work? Matt's going to give you some insights with a huge case study of a very successful project that they launched in their company. So if we can go to the next slide, please, I'm going to turn it over to you, Matt, to share your awesome story with us. Thanks, Jill. Appreciate it. I, I would say, um, you know, and I'll, and I'll share with everyone a quick, uh, you know, firsthand example. But before I even do, I mean, when you talk about, you don't normally think of, when you think of a CFO, you don't normally think of innovation. The truth is, you know, in our experience, a company won't even get to the stage of innovation unless they have a strong CFO in place in the first place to run proper checks and balances, pressure testing, whatever, you know, run scenarios, whatever it might be. Um, so behind your most innovative ideas really needs to be a strong financial discipline and rigor um, in order to succeed. And, you know, Jill, I know you and I had talked about this earlier, but one thing that we're really proud of here at N6A is our Pace Points program. It's one of the first um, it's one of our greatest examples of innovation through the years. It's one of the first employer rewards programs that lets employees choose uh, their own perks according to what motivates them. We have uh, categories for cash and travel and experiences and health and wellness and all kinds of incredible stuff. Um, anyhow, there's a lot of sizzle in the program is my point. And it's been one of our greatest examples of innovation and, um, and it's been a great recruiting tool and our, you know, and retention tool and so on and so forth. But behind that innovation was, you know, was, was a pretty, you know, boring, but absolutely necessary uh, and diligent process of checks and balances and financial rigor. We rolled the program out in 2018 to our employees, but by the time it was ready for showtime in 2018, we had already spent a year in 2017 you know, going through a really, really long and arduous uh, testing process led by our CFO. And the testing process included everything from, 
you know, he literally did a year long dress rehearsal where he actually applied the points to every employee in the company as if the program was already up and running to see what each employee would have received. You know, he studied each accounting methodology, expense accruals, forfeitures impact. You know, he assigned values to each of the cash and non-cash rewards. I mean, it was a super diligent process, which also, in, going back to my earlier point about alignment between CFO and the other departments, it also, that one year um, testing process also uh, involved heads of other departments too. You know, there were logistics requirements, there were recruiting requirements, there's all sorts of uh, impact across every one of the departments. And we use the CFO as the nucleus that sort of held all of that together. So behind the financial discipline, there was also a discipline in terms of pressure testing across other departments. And then by the time we rolled it out to the employees, we sort of had already seen everything. I mean, there were so many details that if we had rolled pace points out to our employees before we went through proper pressure testing, I mean, it could have been catastrophic to the business from a you know financial liability standpoint, as well as just from you know the demands of the logistics behind it. All of that would have been a complete disaster, and uh, we were able to avoid it because there was a really strong rigor and discipline. And it's just a great example, in summary, of um, how any you know great example of innovation really needs to be born from some level of rigor and discipline led by finance. I love that example so much. I think the program is absolutely phenomenal. You guys have gotten some great press about it. But what I also really appreciate in that, Matt, is the kind of humility you take in approaching it that if we have to sit on this for a year, year and a half before it's launched so we get it right and we make sure we have that rigor, that pressure testing, all of that behind it, you're willing to do so. Reconcile that with what we talked about earlier, kind of the importance of speed and accuracy and things, and how are you kind of managing the balance between those two? Well, look, I think there's, uh, I think you're constantly, you were, we're pretty rigorous, Jill, in terms of how we're looking at and evaluating our performance in both of those departments. When it comes to speed, you know, it's like the karate kid with, you know, wax on, wax off. I mean, it starts with a very boring, you know, boring sort of uh, mundane, uh, practice, right? But then in time, as you do that with repetition, with repetition and rigor, and you, you know, you analyze what you could have done better, you find that your speed improves. So decisions that, you know, I make and my C-level team and our, you know, management team makes today that takes us literally seconds, you know, year, two, three years ago, took us minutes, took us hours, but, you know, it really comes down to making sure you have the right process, the right rigor in place so that you evaluate speed as if it were any other KPI in your organization. And just each, you know, each time you're you're running you're running systems to make sure that you're getting incrementally better. And then the same thing, you know, accuracy is a little bit easier, obviously, to measure because you know, did you get it right or you did you get it wrong? I mean, those things are pretty uh, objective in terms of data sets and what you can get better at. The challenge with accuracy usually comes to the subject, you know, to the gray area where you know, when you're talking about accuracy with people decisions, when you're talking about accuracy with non-financial um, impact decisions, that's where there's a little bit more. Um, you know, sub subjectiveness that's required. And, you know, that, that, that's where going back to what Carl was saying earlier, I think communication and empathetic skills are important for a CFO because they need to sort of understand those and be switched on when you need to evaluate in the gray area, because not everything can always be traced back to, you know, to dollars and cents. And what a great thought to end the formal part of this presentation on. Thank you, Matt, for all of that transparency and for sharing your company's story with us in that way. We're going to now transition into the quote-unquote formal Q&A portion of this, although we've been answering questions and getting them pitched throughout. But of course, if you'd like to submit some, please go ahead and do that in the questions area. We're going to get as many covered as we possibly can. So to start us off, Carl, I'm going to pitch this first question to you. The question is, if you are a small company, right, you're just starting out, um, you're in very early stages, and you definitely don't have the budget to afford a CFO, even though you know it's important, what are some of the smaller interim steps that you can take to build up to getting that acumen and getting that investment level where you can afford the right person? Sure. Um, I think that's a great question, Jill, uh, and thank you to whoever asked that. Uh, and this is a, a challenge that I come across in small and mid-sized companies all the time. Uh, a lot of them want to uh, level up their financial capabilities, but admittedly they don't have a CFO. Uh, and even you know, if they have the budget to afford one, they might not need one. 
And so the point that, that I would make is really ask yourself, do you need somebody with the title CFO uh, to be accomplished the tasks, or can you have those tasks and analytics be done by perhaps a VP of finance or a head of finance, or in some cases, maybe even a financial manager or a financial analyst. Uh, you don't necessarily need somebody who is, you know, has 20 years of experience and the level of compensation that goes with that. So definitely consider somebody who uh, is very capable, is very hungry, but might not uh, require so much of your budget. A couple of other areas that I would encourage uh, companies to explore is one, can you outsource the function? Uh, for several years, uh, I've been doing outsourced CFO work and that a company may come to me and say, well, we need 10 hours a month of your time or 20 hours a month of your time. They don't need somebody to work 50 hours a week at that kind of a price tag. Uh, today, because of the uh, you know kind of gig economy and freelancer network, there are lots and lots of part-time outsourced CFOs or senior financial leaders who can be very helpful. And then just in terms of training and development, I can't emphasize enough the importance of upskilling and giving people well-rounded financial experience. Uh, that comes in the form of rotational programs, uh, training, uh, coaching, and mentorship. There are some phenomenal resources out there uh, that offer uh, you know, public trainings and also trainings that can come in-house to your company. Uh, they aren't tremendously expensive, but they can make a lot of change very, very quickly. Thank you so much, Carl. Amazing resources you just provided. Matt, I'm going to immediately kick this next question to you so we can get to as many as possible. Matt, how big of a team do you need to have making the big decisions in the company? So you talked a lot about decision making. That core team that's making the decisions, those final decisions, how big is it and what is your advice? Well, look, the first thing I would say, Jill, is it's the quality of the team over the quantity of the team. So, you know, over the course of, you know, our journey in business over the past 10 years, you know, sometimes I've found that we've made the best decisions as a management team when we've been the fewest. And, you know, sometimes we haven't made the best decisions when we've been, uh, you know, the largest. So I would really look at the quality of the people over the quantity of the people, um, you know, to give a little bit more, um, you know, specifics into that, you know, specific answer to that question. I, I would say, just generally speaking, you know, at a direct report level, you know, finance obviously reports to me, operations reports to me, sales reports to me, and uh, the head of our service operation report to me. And then each one of them will have three to four direct reports. And, you know, I think that's kind of within the span of control, you know, best practices within the span of control rule. Uh, but again, I would take, you know, 12 direct reports if they were all, you know, high quality versus, you know, two direct reports if they were low quality or vice versa. Thank you for that, Matt. I totally agree about the quality of the people making those decisions and on that team. Um, let me do this. Let me go ahead and switch to the last slide here, and we're going to rapid fire go through some of this and get some more questions for you. But because I know we're going to probably run right up to the last second, I don't want to miss this opportunity to generously thank Oracle NetSuite because without them, this webinar would not be happening. I wouldn't be here. Our amazing panelists wouldn't be here. NetSuite's the one who made it all possible, and they also happen to be an amazing provider, a cloud-based solution of these tools that you need to really get your financial thing in order. So if you haven't heard of them before, haven't checked them out, definitely go to netsuite.com and just give them a look because especially for businesses that are in that growing stage where you may not have everything in place yet, Every entrepreneur I've ever talked to, and I'm sure Carl and Matt both agree, it is better to put the tool in place before you need it than after you already need it. So definitely thank you to NetSuite and bringing us all here together because without you, this conversation wouldn't be happening. Carl, I want to give um, the next question to you here. One of the follow-ups that came from your previous question was, as you're a growing company, if you can't afford a CFO yet, maybe informing your board of advisors is having a CFO maybe from another company as part of your board of advisors and something you would recommend. I think that that's a great idea. Um, you don't necessarily have to have a formal board of directors with fiduciary responsibility to the company, but you can have a informal board of advisors made up of experts with lots of experience um, who either give their uh, their time and experience for free or for inexpensive. 
Uh, I've served on a board uh, for several companies in North America. Uh, and ultimately, the owner of the company said, well, I need somebody who has uh, a lot of background in finance. I need somebody with background in sales. I need somebody with industry experience. And so by bringing us all together, they could tap into each one of our expertise and not need us to be involved full time. I think that that's a, a very smart uh, way to get somebody's services. Uh, respecting obviously their their time and schedule, um, but not have to outlay a tremendous amount of of cash in order to pro procure that. Excellent. So we're going to go into some rapid fire questions to maximize the time we have left. Matt, first one to you. As much as you can give us in a short period of time, evaluating your CFO or financial roles in the organization. What are the things you absolutely must be doing to evaluate their performance? I would recommend having a, I'll try to get through this quickly, I'll, I'd recommend having a monthly financial session. Our CFO puts together a financial package. We'll establish KPIs, financial KPIs per department, you know, sales goals, how we're tracking against that, you know, data sliced by vertical, data sliced by um, account value, data sliced by service product. Um, do the same thing for the service operation, you know, what we're spending on hiring, what we're spending on recruiting. Um, do the same for you know, non-service and non-sales functions, you know, what's our expenditure by department, you know, how does that, you know, how does that um, compare to what the KPIs we set were? So I think that that monthly financial um, fi financial process and meetings, I think those are important. Uh, we'll also meet every week, Monday morning, first thing, 8 a.m., and we'll cover um, the goals across departments for the week, and, you know, finance sort of owns each one of those in some way, shape, or form, and then we'll do follow-through on Friday to make sure that we hit deadlines and we accomplish the goals for the week, so that's... Um, those are some big ones that come to mind right off the bat. Rapid fire, love it so much, Matt. Carl, the next one is to you. Any tips that you have very quickly on, we talked a lot about beyond the financial role, how can companies actively work on integrating financial professionals into the rest of the organization when it may not have been happening before? And we're missing your audio right now, Carl. One, as I had highlighted, uh, one, I just uh, there are a couple of areas that I think are really, really important is one is cross training is making sure that financial professionals are mixing and mingling with sales and marketing, purchasing, operations, warehousing, HR, and making sure that those financial professionals are understanding those parts of the business as thoroughly as they possibly can, and vice versa, making sure that those non-financial professionals are understanding the financial implications. And then the, the other part that I would suggest is really exploring uh, and discovering what sort of financial platforms or uh, operational integrated platforms are going to serve the company best. To the point that you made previously, Jill, uh, thinking about the structure of the business before growth uh, can save a tremendous amount of time and, and wasted money. And that's really why these you know, integrated software platforms are so valuable now, is they're modulized. And as the company grows, they can start to add and enhance the existing modules. Thank you, Carl. Matt, question to you. Will the CFO's main purpose of kind of the dollars and the cents be impacted negatively with the non-financial expansion of their role? So continuing this thought on integration, are you seeing any of that impact happening? No, I think, in fact, the opposite. I think it's improving the overall financial performance of the operation. The more the CFO uh, knows and studies non-financial functions and um, and uh, operations within the organization, I think the better off you're going to be financially for it. Because I, I do think that the good CFOs really come in um, in the area of discretion. You know, there's black and white and then there's gray. And I think the best CFOs are the ones who know how to optimize efficiency and cost savings to the organization in the gray. And in order to know about the gray, you really need a 360 degree, you know, perspective and view of the organization, which includes obviously stepping outside of, you know, the finance role. Thank you so much, Matt. And we are at the end of our hour, but I want to give you a one last chance to get, I mean, a really, really short snippet of brilliance from each of our panelists. So, Carl, one last closing thought. In terms of the future of finance, what should people be paying attention to? Carl, go. If there's anything, think about being more proactive than reactive. It's about being a financial business partner and ultimately a strategist, not a financial reporting person.
Love it so, so much, Carl. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today. There's many thank yous coming in to both you and Matt on the questions area. I love seeing those. And Matt, closing thought here to you, what is the most important thing you want to leave with our audience? I think there needs to be a balance of discretion with data when you look at the finance function, and I think data without uh, dis discretion is destruction, and I, I would reemphasize that. I love that quote so much, Matt. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. To everyone on the line, thank you for being one of the most interactive audiences that I have ever had the pleasure to work with. You all have been such a joy. Thanks for participating. Thanks for giving some amazing questions. It's been such a pleasure to moderate this with you. If you look in the chat, the next one I'm moderating is about telling your business's financial story, and it's so incredibly important. So there's a link in the chat for you that my friend Jason, an entrepreneur, put up. So please click on that, check, register. Would love to see you again on a future webinar. And again, a massive round of applause and thanks to Oracle NetSuite. NetSuite, without you, we wouldn't be here today. Thank you for making this all possible. Everyone on the line, look for that recording in your inbox within about a week. On behalf of Entrepreneur and NetSuite, thanks for joining us today. We can't wait to see you on another webinar.